Why does reading sacred scripture matter so much to our life of faith? How do you read scripture? And why is Lent such a great time to begin? Join us today as we answer those questions with Mark Hart, who is the author of the new book, Unleashing the Power of Scripture, A Guide for Catholics. I'm Father Dave Pavanka, and I'm president of Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. Welcome to Franciscan University Presents. I'm your host, Father Dave Pavonka, and I'm president of Franciscan University of Steubenville. And we're talking today about unleashing the power of Scripture. I'm joined by our panelist, Dr. Regis Martin, professor of systematic theology here at Franciscan University, and Dr. Scott Hahn, who is the Father Michael Scanlon Professor of Biblical Theology and the New Evangelization here at Franciscan. We're very pleased to welcome our special guest, Mark Hart. Mark lives in Phoenix with his wife and three daughters and serves as the executive vice president of Life Team International. He travels the globe speaking to millions of people, millions of people, and hosts a weekly podcast titled Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. He's the author and best-selling author and co-author of over a dozen books, including his newest, which we will be discussing, Unleashing the Power of Scripture, A Guide for Catholics. Mark, it's good to see you again. Good to see you, Father. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So, why did you write this book? You know, okay, so growing up Catholic, fifth of six kids, fourth of five boys, my mom's already a canonized saint. Oh, She's nice. still with us. That's convenient. Um, but yeah, honestly, growing up Catholic, I was, I was a typical parochial Catholic school product, but no one ever really explained to me how to read Scripture, where to start, what to do, and it wasn't because of my parents, it wasn't any, you know, they didn't do anything wrong. It just, no one ever just took me and said, here, here is how you read Scripture. Here's where you start. Okay. So. I just was sitting back and, and I have so many conversations with Catholics, young and old, saying, I want to read the Bible. I really want to read it. I just don't know where to start. I didn't get a theology degree. I never got to go to some place like Franciscan. So where do I start? And I thought, you know what? Why not put something in their hands that says, let's just walk you step by step through where to go, where not to go, which is equally important, I think, when you're opening the Bible, right? Just so you can start developing your own rhythm of prayer in line with the church that says, this is where you start. This is how you start, what to watch for, what to watch out for. This is how you can start making scripture part of your everyday life. Okay. So you and I have been friends for a long time. Yes, I've read the other stuff that you've done. This is fantastic. And I'm like, why? Why didn't you start with this? I mean, because you really, it, it seems to me so, it, it's so good. You walk the person by the hand, you, you tell them where to look, you show, I mean, it's just a great, great tool. I wish I would have thought of it, honestly. Yeah, okay, you know? that's I mean, there interesting. Are, there are other, you know, books that, that came first, but the more, uh, I guess, I guess, you know, last, I've been traveling, like I said, we don't travel for years, travel 20, 25 years, you'll be at a conference and someone will say, I, I love, you know, what you're saying, I love yeah. what you're talking about, but Give me something practical, and and I just I, I believe so strongly in it's it's so important to give modern Catholics. We're all busy. Everyone's busy, right? We all we have one neuron still firing about nine o'clock at night, right? We're all so tired. Give me something tangible that I can just go page by page at my own pace. And you know what's funny is that so many Catholics they actually know Scripture better than they think they do. Right, right. They just don't realize they right, do. Right, right. Because Scripture is just imbued into everything we do in the Mass and the Rosary, every form of prayer. It's there. Okay. We just don't know it's there. So. Be able to take somebody you know, over a cup of coffee or a glass of wine, being able to say, hey, at your own pace, let's just connect these dots now. Let's figure out what we're already doing, and let's figure out how to go a little bit deeper, a little more intentional into God's Word. Yeah, that's great. Oh, I don't want to cause trouble, uh, but, <laughs> but, it, yeah. but we're accustomed to we're, it. We're early on in the love fest, but I don't wish to interrupt it, but I, I'm struck by a certain disconnect. Uh, a 10-year-old uh, mm -hmm. who's an altar boy, which I think you were, and the only inducement that could be deployed to draw his attention to Mass was the prospect of the chocolate donut Absolutely. when it was over. You're not going to introduce a 10-year-old uh, to Scripture, are you? Absolutely. Maybe not in this book, but if, if, we, if we can introduce the parents to Scripture, where now all of a sudden the Word of God becomes a regular part of their own prayer rhythm as a mother, a father, a couple, a family, if that starts to happen, what I, would, what I would contest is that if we can make, for instance, make the Sunday readings come to life at home. 
Yo. Make Because you're already going to Mass, right? Let's make the Sunday readings come to life in a way where you're discussing the first reading over dinner on a Monday. You're discussing the psalm, you know, over, over a snack on a Wednesday, whatever. But you start walking through those readings in the course of the week. If the parents can start to do that in a more intentional way. Well, now we've taken a lot of the, a lot of the stress off of the, that poor lector on Sunday. Right. Because now when the kids are sitting down in the pew, whether they're 7 or 17, it's not the first time they've heard these readings before. Yo. So, I mean, we, we put so, so their much own idea about it. Yeah. But, but, but we put so much pressure. I mean, it, it, now, we're, now we're saying, well, the lector has to be not just literate, but a good, a good reader. Yeah. We're putting so much extra pressure on the homily for poor father. Right. But if the family has entered into the scriptures, all four of them, prior to Mass, now the whole first half, the whole liturgy of the Word comes to life now in a different way. Even at the age of 10, Catholics have been exposed to scripture almost the way you're exposed to the landscape of your own neighborhood. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. So when you said Catholics know scripture better than they think they do, mm -hmm. that was my experience. I mean, when I came into the church some 35 years ago, I, I, I got that sense that Catholics don't know the Bible. Mm -hmm. They're certainly intimidated by those of us who think we do. And then you, st you, you start to have conversations with Catholics, and you realize that they have been exposed, you know, to the Eucharistic liturgy, to the liturgy of the Word. Mm -hmm. And especially in the last 50-some years since the new lectionary was adopted in 1970, there's a 400% increase in the amount of Old Testament readings. Mm -hmm. And so it's like a kid who grows up. He knows his neighborhood. He doesn't know it the way the mailman does, you know, right. who's memorized every address attached to the names. Right. But you know, you know the neighborhood better than the mailman. In some ways, you know the backyards, you know the, the shortcuts, you know the woods and all of that kind of thing. I would say, however, that Catholics don't know the Bible nearly as well as they ought to because sure. it's like when you get your learner's permit, mm -hmm. then you begin to connect the dots where, you know, mom and dad used to drive me to my friend's house or to the high school or, you know, to the, the ball field and that kind of thing. And as you begin to drive yourself, then you begin to have a mental map. See, now you're speaking together. my language, because now I'm teaching number two child on how to drive. Yeah. And, and it's one thing to say, oh, it's the third street, it's the fifth street. We actually right. start to put names to the streets, and they start to figure out on their own. That's they right. Say, okay, so it's not just taking a right, it's taking a right on this street at this intersection. And they start to see how all the, it's almost as though you, when you walk your kids out when they're kids, and you show them the night sky, and they see all these bright lights, they see all these stars. Yeah. But when they come to a place w with Scripture, and this is why it's so wonderful being Catholic, because we have context, mm -hmm. right? Because it's not just content, it's context. So you'll walk out with your kids of any age and say, it's not just the stars. Look at the constellations. Yeah. And that's what the doctors of the church, that's what the great Scripture scholars give us is the context. See how all these dots connect. Yeah. Because when the dots connect, they start to see constellations instead of stars. They start to understand covenant. They start to understand story. And they start to understand their place in the story. And then all of a sudden now, it's not just this vast universe that I'm a small part of, but now it's this universe that I start to understand. Yeah, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, it's like Orion's belt. It is, you know, it is. You're beginning to Absolutely. connect all you, of you, So you yeah. walk this fine line of, of Catholics do know the Scriptures more than they thought they did, but then also inviting Catholics into the Scriptures. So how do you, there's often this, I don't know, competition or comparison between Catholics and Protestants. How would you characterize that then? I would. Well, I mean, uh, do, do, do the Protestants really know the scriptures? Like, well, let's, okay, let's be honest. If we were playing, if you take a, uh, on, a, on a random Sunday morning, you head into a mega Bible church, and you head into a Catholic church, and say so you take ten people out of both, and we go play Bible Jeopardy, we're most likely going to get we're slain. Not, we're not we gonna are. Win that we're, game. we're not going to win that game, right? <laughs> yeah. However, again, and I think this pours the context. Given that the Bible was put together by the Catholic Church, right? There, there's, there's a context to say it. Say more about that. Well, I think uh, people are always shocked, you know, to, fi to find out that, wow, the, the Bible didn't drop out of heaven in a, in a Ziploc bag. Yeah. Like, it didn't come that way, right? I mean, it took centuries of, de of debate and discernment and prayer for us to come to the 73 books that we have now. The canon, you know, the canon means measuring, measuring rod, right? To come to the canon that we have now. But I think that for so many Catholics, for instance, you might feel dismayed. Through, oh, gosh, you know, my, my friend, you know, who goes to this Bible church, they seem to just it just falls off their lips. I mean, they, they, it's so seamless. They see a chapter and verse, and they're shocked to find out that the Mass is just filled with Scripture from beginning to end. That, I mean, they'll, they'll come across a turn of phrase, and I didn't know it was in the Bible. But I think what's wonderful is that you say, yes, we have our, our, our evangelical brothers and sisters who know the Bible well, and God bless them for it. We can learn a lot from a lot of them in the way that they go about it. But for them to say, or Catholics to say, hang on, but, but because of the beauty of tradition, the beauty of the magisterium, and all the most brilliant men and women who have gone before us, who have given us this context, not just the details, but the con you know, context means woven together. 
how all these details are woven together and how they're lived out yeah. in faith and how they lived out the faithful expression, what we call our Catholic faith. Right. So it's not just, oh gosh, on Sunday for an hour and a half, I'm gonna take the Bible off the shelf yeah. you know, during Mass, but to say, no, it's this lived expression that we've well, seen. Okay. Just... Suppose uh, somebody watching the show is still unconvinced. Mm -hmm. um, He'll probably be thinking to himself, you know, I'm Joe Sixpack, Scott's favorite uh, image. <laughs> I'm not at all. I'm not at all like Scott, and probably not like you either. You guys are not typical. You're unusual. I mean, Scott was born with a Bible in his hand, <laughs> and by age two, he had memorized most of the the prophets. So, what what is the catalytic uh, event that sort of kickstarts everything. It, it can't be the Bible. It's got to be something else, some sort of encounter. Well, my home is bribery. I find that if I bribe my kids, <laughs> yeah. that they're more inclined to... No. Yeah. Um, I'll say it, it's always going to start with that personal relationship. You know, it wasn't as though, yeah. oh gosh, I was 16 and someone handed me a Bible and I was just, I said, oh, I'm holding holy writ and, and lamentations has so enraptured my soul, I can't yeah. stop reading yeah. it. Yeah. But that moment when you have that first encounter with the Lord and the Lord draws near. You know, I was 16 years old. The Lord, the Lord I was on a retreat. I'll never forget. I can remember. And we, we all have those moments, right? We all met that one, that first moment when God became real and God drew near. It's, you know, it says this in James 4, you know, when you draw near to God, God will draw near to you. I love that, the simplicity and, and how profound that is. But the Lord drew near and he pulled me close and he was right there. And all of a sudden I knew that there is a God. It's not me, which is quite a revelation when you're 16, right? There's a God and it's not you. But all of a sudden it was, well, if this God is real, then this is no longer words about God. This is the word of God. Yeah. And that that minor difference, that preposition right. of versus, you know, about is the major difference. Yeah. So all of a sudden realize, wow, this is the word of God. And now I have a real decision to make on how I'm going to live my life. Yeah. You know? I, I would say that in my experience, it was also a retreat, mm -hmm. an encounter with Jesus Christ, my personal Savior and Lord, entering into a relationship with Him, praying, picking up the Bible, falling asleep night after night. It was discovering a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. Veni mm -hmm. Sancti Spiritus. It was really a prayer that I began to pray, come Holy Spirit. It wasn't profound, but I, I recognized I, I the need it, for the Holy differ. Spirit. Yeah, that <laughs> is a, I beg to differ, yeah. it's pretty profound. <laughs> well, I didn't realize at the time, yeah, it yeah. just seemed so simple, yeah. childlike, you know. Yeah. And uh, I don't remember the exact chronology, but I remember after the retreat, feeling guilty for falling asleep night after night trying to read the right. Bible. I mean, 1 Corinthians, why would that make me drowsy? I just couldn't follow Paul. <laughs> I had some people pray for me because I was asking the Holy Spirit for help, and they did, and I had some experience. But it wasn't the experience. It was discovering months later that almost to the day, my experience of reading Scripture was transformed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And suddenly it was not like a cadaver, you know, that you're dissecting and just trying to make sense out of the organs or whatever. It was living, breathing, it was on fire. And it never has gone out. And I think what's important, mm -hmm. Scott, this was before you had a doctorate. Yeah, this, this was before I was out of before, high school. This yeah. was before you had written books. Mm -hmm. So that there was something about that that, and you alluded to it, Regis, that that one does not have to have a degree in theology mm -hmm. or a degree or be able to read Latin and Greek. That that how does the average Catholic get into this? How do they get into the Scripture? Well, I think that's the beauty of it. Right? I mean, I mean, here's our Lord, second person of the Trinity, you know, incarnate Word. He could have preached in sermons that would have made Aquinas look like a preschooler. Right. Mm -hmm. He chose to employ stories. Yeah. I mean, the God of the universe chose to tell parables. Yeah. That, should, that should tell us something. I mean, the Sermon on the Mount, you read the entire Sermon on the Mount beginning to end, had he done it that way, it's, it's shorter than a TED Talk. Right. Each one of the Beatitudes is shorter than 140 characters. I mean, it's very social media that. friendly. You can tweet every one of them, right? right. Tweet, tweet others as you want to be tweeted. I mean, that this is the, 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 I mean, the God of the universe understood something when it comes to communication principles. And you say, well, how do I do? You start. It's just about knowing where, where to start, where not to start. But even to your point, I mean, gosh, you open up St. Paul. I mean, first time I read St. Paul, I'm thinking, brother, use a comma. Use a verb. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, even St. Peter, right? In, in First Peter says, gosh, that Paul is smart. I mean, he says a lot of big words. I mean, he's, he's really hard to understand sometimes. I mean, even, even our first pope is saying this. It can be challenging and daunting. And I think we can get so discouraged because if you don't, you don't have somebody to walk you through it, and you've never opened up the scriptures on your own, it can be really daunting because I mean, you, you get wrapped up in Leviticus, you get wrapped up in Lamentations or some of the minor prophets, and you're thinking to yourself, I, I, I don't understand. So I think it's about building up that confidence. The same way if, if, if you don't normally work out, mm -hmm. you go to the gym, you have a trainer, 
you start to work out and you start to build that confidence. You start to build that muscle. You don't overdo it at the beginning. You just build up and, and as you start to build it, you grow in confidence. You start to see a difference. You start yeah. to feel better and you keep going back. Yeah, yeah. As you keep going back, all of a sudden now the, the change is internal. It's not just the external, but it's the internal change. And that internal change can fuel everything and make you start to grow in confidence, to grow in desire. The more I started reading scripture, the more I desired to read scripture. It was the craziest thing. I, I got into reading scripture because I wanted to prove people wrong. I wanted to prove every <laughs> non-Catholic wrong. I'm going to go in there with I my scripture that, as the yeah. sword. I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm going to Did you scripture. ever have anyone in the church encourage you to this? Absolutely. Church? Absolutely. My first youth minister, he was a tremendous, it still is a tremendous man of God. And I'd never seen anybody, it wasn't that, that he quoted chapter and verse right. so well, but when he talked about the Bible. There was such an enthusiasm. You know, I know I can't stay know. contagious because right, right. of the whole COVID thing, oh. but it was so contagious. Yeah, it yeah. was. It was. I said, I want what he has. Yeah. He has a certitude and a peace and a joy and a confidence. I want that. Mm -hmm. And the more I started to read scripture, the more I started to grow in certitude. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, we have so much more to discuss. So stay with us as Franciscan University presents continues. My favorite Bible passage, I would have to say, is my household verse, which is, um, the household is Carrie Domini, and it's rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. I think it just helps me to meet people where they're at and love them the way that they need to, and it's a good daily encouragement. Growing up, my family and I were very involved um, with Bible studies at our parish, and we had encountered a lot of people who were older coming back to the faith. And in encountering the Word of God through these Bible studies, they realized that all the answers to their problems were right there. And welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We're talking about unleashing the power of Scripture. And I think particularly in this time of Lent, it's a real blessing for mm -hmm. us to be able to spend some more time with the scriptures. But I think you can go into it, and I think honestly some people are intimidated. It's like, what do you read? How do you read it? What's what story? What's so? How, is everything literally true? How do you go into it and enter the scripture? I I always went into it believing everything was literally true because that's mm -hmm. just what you take, right? Okay. So I had I had. Um, I'm not even going to say well-intentioned. I had a lot of teachers, uh -huh. right, who would, who would dismiss the Bible because, well, you know, six 24-hour periods. I mean, we have got, we've got all this data that says the world's billions of years old, six 24-hour yeah. yeah. And I think I let that, I'll, I would say, the proposed high-mindedness of those teachers, whether it was high school, whatever, okay. to affect me. Okay. And all of a sudden, you start to learn, you say, wait, hold on a second. So the church doesn't teach? Right. That we have to believe that that's, you know, that those first, you know, those early 11 chapters of Genesis, that that can be allegory, that, that, that it's still true. Right. But, right. I mean, I'm not looking to the Bible to be a scientific textbook, you know. Right. And, uh, you know, you know, you know, what, you know what blew my mind? When I learned that the word Bible didn't mean book, mm -hmm. but it meant collection of books. Yeah. Now, that seems really insignificant, right? No, it, that's, yeah, it, really It seems insignificant. Mark. Yeah, on, you're on, absolutely right. But I was like, I said, wait, hold on a second. Collection. And all of a sudden, you're, well, so these are poems and songs, and love letters, and documents, and That's, all these different types of writing. And all of a sudden, it was it seemed so silly. You do that so well, Mark, in, in, in trying to identify for the reader what it is they're reading, because that you've used the word context a couple of times. That helps the context to be able to well, understand. Well, it's everything. It. I mean, I'm not, if I'm looking to write a wonderful sonnet for my wife, I'm not going to pick up a biology textbook, yeah. right? If I'm, if I'm looking to figure out my taxes, I'm not going to pick up song lyrics. You go to different types of books and different types of writing based upon your need or your desire. So to be able to, to flip that switch, as it were, when you're reading through Scripture and say, I can't read the Gospels the same way I read early Genesis, and I can't read Revelation the same way I read Isaiah. I have to understand, as Pope Benedict wrote so wonderfully, and as, as those who have gone before us have written, to say, there is a purpose behind everything in there, but you have to understand who the intended audience was, what the tone was, what the writing style was. And if you understand those things, now you can read it. You know, it's, it's exegesis reading, you know, out of the scriptures, mm -hmm. what God intended, mm -hmm. versus eisegesis, reading into it with my own issues, my own preconceived right. notions, my own 21st century mentality. And to be able to do that intelligently really is, it's not just an art form, it's a skill that seems to have been lost right. somewhere in the last few right. centuries. Right. Right. Well, I mean, this all sort of presupposes a, a level of learning. 
that most of us haven't yet acquired. So how do you jumpstart that? Uh, for example, this is Lent, uh, and maybe the priest is proposing that you pick up the Bible as a Lenten exercise, you know, a, a discipline. Well, how do you move from the discipline to the delight? I mean, I, I've had kids who were forced to learn the bloody violin, mm -hmm. and they hated it. It's pitiless if you hit the wrong note. Everybody runs screaming <laughs> from the room. But after a while, having, in, you know, having internalized the discipline, it's no longer exacting. It becomes exhilarating because they're hitting the right note, and it's music. It's beautiful. How do you get to that stage? That's a great question. I always say, I'll say my, for my own kids, and, my, and, and when I'm even dealing with young adults, right, teenagers, young adults, I, you, you start with what you know. And so I, and no offense to anyone here, I always say do not start in Genesis, personally. Yes, it's the beginning of the story. Yes, we have to understand the story. Right. But again, to liken the analogy to working out, if you're not accustomed to working out, if you go to the gym and lift weights for two hours, you will not be able to turn off your alarm clock the next day because you're gonna be so sore. Yeah. And so to be able to go in and say, hey, let's start in the Gospels. Let's start in the Gospels. Let's start with stories you know, with, with names you can pronounce, with places you can still find on a map. Yeah. Let's start with, with what you have already, what you're already accustomed to, let's start there, and let's start to build this muscle memory together. And secondarily, what I'll say is, you know, we're, we have such a gift with the way that the, that in modern Bibles, the way that the chapters are broken down into subchapters. We also have this this Western civilization mentality of, I'm going to open up a book, I'm going to read it until my eyes get tired, until I fall asleep, I get some great mystery novel, and I say, no, you can open up the Gospel of Mark. And you can spend time, you can spend 30 minutes just in that, those three verses of the baptism in the River Jordan. And those three verses can be so profound. When you hear, when you watch the, the, the heavens being ripped open, you hear the Word of God boom out of heaven. When you hear those words, this is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. And to be able to have that moment where you have to come to grips with the fact that by virtue of our baptism through divine sonship, He's not just talking about God, he's, Jesus, He's talking about me. Yeah. And to have that moment where you say, well, I can, I can do this, but to read a subchapter for 15, 20 minutes, and not just the whole chapter where you can go far deeper. Yeah, the thing I think you do really, really well, Mark, is that this encouragement that continue it seems to go through the entire book, and that is to place yourself in that story. Mm -hmm. So it's not just you reading something that happened 2,000 years ago, but being present to that. So how, I think it goes to your point, is how does the person do that? What's, I mean, really practically, how do you do that? How do you to take that well, scripture story you just shared of, of the baptism. Well, of for, so for instance, so, so um, there's, there's a quote attributed to Kierkegaard that says, "Scripture speaks about me, and Scripture speaks to me, right? To me and about me." So in that moment of the, of the baptism, you know, if I was taking my own kids, yeah. I'd say, you know, we'd come in, we'd, we'd read it like Lexio Divina, the art of you know reading. Say, where are you in this picture? Are you on a bluff overlooking the Jordan? Yeah. Are you on the shore looking out at the Lord and the Baptist? Or are you in the water? Can you feel the humidity in the air, the flies buzzing? Mm -hmm. can, you, can you hear the bubbling of the water? In those moments, and to say, okay, and, and why are you in this? So put yourself into it. But again, in every situation, we have to realize, it's, I'm not just reading about Adam and Eve. I am Adam. Yeah. You are Eve. We all have the fruit juice running down our faces. We are all sinners. <laughs> and in that moment, to be able to say, no, hold on a second. God is speaking about me here. So, I mean, so we, we, we'll, we'll praise King David for, you know, the mighty conqueror and leader. He was also a, a wreck. He was a wreck at home as a husband and a father. I mean, to be able to, for, for a modern reader to be able to look at this and say, I see myself in these characters. Mm -hmm. And when we get to that moment, to be able to invite somebody and take them by the hand and say, go deeper. Don't just do the, just don't just do the, the, the first reading. Like, don't just gloss over that reading. It's like an iceberg. 90% of it's going to be beneath the surface. Mm -hmm. So I would say less is more. Read less. But read it multiple times. Just slow down. Go Keep deeper. Yeah. Don't feel as though you're trying to, I have to finish this book this week, this chapter this week. No, jump into that subchapter. Enough snorkeling. You know, if we yeah, just take yeah. the time and, and deep dive and scuba dive a little yeah, yeah. bit, the Holy Spirit can really enrapture your heart and your soul. And all of a sudden you'll be sitting there, you know, oh, hypothetically, yeah, yeah. this never happened to me, yeah. you know, on a plane at 30,000 feet and you've got tears streaming down your face because you're so overwhelmed by the love of God. And you're reading this in your own Bible and you're thinking, I've never seen this before. Yeah. And the Lord is speaking to me. But there's the a most, grace in that. There's a grace. Oh, it's the most inopportune yeah, time too. You yeah, know, someone's yeah. trying to hand you peanuts and a drink, and you're just, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't function right now because the Lord loves me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, to connect these two sets of comments, you know, the violin, the screech, you know, the horror, the humiliation. You know, you need a teacher. That's the most important thing. Yeah. And you also need to, you need to learn how to listen to how it's played right. And that's what a teacher is for. Yeah. And that's what an older sibling can do too, you know, encourage you. And it, it seems to me that 
you learned from a teacher, mm. but you also learned to read it yourself. And I concur wholeheartedly that, you know, you learn the scales perhaps before you learn some Mozart, you know. Uh, and start with the Gospels. Mm. I'm glad to hear you say it because starting with Genesis, that's daunting. And it isn't too long before you run into Leviticus, which is like quicksand, <laughs> you know. But I would say not only start with the Gospels, but stay with the Gospels. Mm. That's the hinge on which everything turns from the old to the new. And, you know, put yourself into the stories, as you were just saying, in terms of the humidity and the flies and that kind of thing. But most especially with the characters, like Zacchaeus in the Sycamore, you know, or Levi, the tax collector who's too busy, then he gets called. Uh, and I would also say, if you're going to venture out, and eventually you really should, mm -hmm. and it's like the mother bird kicks the little baby out of the nest, I mean, learn how to fly. I would also encourage people to do with the Psalms. It's the, it's the one book of the Bible mm. the church prays 24 seven. It's also something that kind of teaches you to pray because you're reading about David and others praying in a way that you would ordinarily not let yourself pray. You know, mm -hmm. complaint. You know, the complaint Psalms are like 42% of the 150 mm. Psalms. Well, who am I? Well, my kids complain to me all the time, <laughs> right. you know. And so the Lord God knows that when we open up our hearts and we really do lament or complain and say, why have you forsaken me? You know, we're going to get a response. But that's a really important point, right? And there's a reason that the church prays the Psalms 24 seven. Right. And that's, I mean, and this is, and, we all, and it's, it's Thanksgiving, it's praise. Well, it's it's and, not just well, complaint. That's yeah, the yeah. human existence, right? Because we've all been there on Sundays. Lord, you're my rock. You're my savior. I love you. And on Monday morning, well, you've abandoned me. I can't find you. I can't see right. you. Where are you, God? Never hear me. It's it's the reality of life. It's the ebb and flow of life, and that is a that that's a contained in the Psalms par excellence. I mean, yeah. to be able to get there and say, this is the human existence. How can I be so fickle, God, that I can love you and adore you with my lips one day, and feel as though you've abandoned me the next? That is the human condition. That is the psalm. You spent some time in the in your book talking about the Psalms mm -hmm. and office of readings. You want to just say something about that? Well, you know, I I, knew, I had no idea that the church in her wisdom. Uh, had she's really, very smart. She really is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she's learned something over a couple yeah, thousand yeah. years. But to be able to give us this this cycle of readings, both for Sundays, right, but then really throughout the course of the week, that, that there's a season to life, right? That we go through these seasons, and we, like right now we're in Lent. We don't think about the seasons very often. I, I mean, I'm from Arizona. We don't have seasons. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's the surface of the sun, yeah. and then we have nice weather for a couple of days, and that's the surface of the sun again. Right, right. But there's a beauty to the seasons. I mean, we read scripture, especially Old Testament, when they go to war, when they sow, when they reap, when they plant, it's all based on season. And here's our church saying, hey, you know what? We've got, we've we've got, got Advent for Christmas. Right. We've got Lent and Easter time. We have seasons because what? Because life is built on seasons. We've got great seasons. We've have, we have horrible seasons. We have seasons that seem to go on forever, like, I don't know, during a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And the church says, hey, you know what? We've got something for you because we're going to walk with you through the seasons of life. And not just a season of one year, but then as you get older, right? You go from being young to all of a sudden maybe maybe you're married and all of a sudden you've got kids and you've got right. grandkids and there's different seasons. How can the same yeah. passage yeah. speak something differently to me in my 20s or in my 40s or in my 60s? It's the same passage. Yeah. God, the Word of God doesn't change, right? right? But I change. Yeah. Yeah. What, what you're saying uh, confirms a, a really superb Catholic principle that grace builds upon nature. That the covenant that we're given is somehow inserted into a cosmos that we were first given. That the narrative of creation becomes, if you will, the matrix or frame into which this new story is told. And the scripture testifies to that story. And it does have a certain rhythm, a seasonal quality. It speaks uh, to the whole diversity of the human predicament. I mean, I like that. It's as if God understood, this is the man I've come to redeem. I, I know who he is. I can feel his pain. That connection between cosmos and covenant is also the key mm -hmm. to creation because you see, it's not talking about how much clock time it took God for, for God to make the world. Yeah. It's showing a goal, a teleology, a purpose. And what is it? It's the seventh day. Well, what's that? It's the Sabbath. So what? That's the sign of the covenant. We're not just dealing with Carl Sagan's cosmos, <laughs> right. some wasteland. We're really seeing an order that everything is ordered to, ah, the covenant, the seventh day, the Sabbath, but also the man waking up and discovering his bride. And there's a covenant planted like a seed within creation called marriage. It's not man-made, it's God-given, it's fruitful. It shows what the truth of life is all about, it's love. And then when we fast forward, we recognize like bookends, heavens and earth and marriage, the new heavens, the new earth and the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
What a coincidence? No. Yeah. But, how, yeah. but how often have we reduced keep holy the Sabbath merely to make it to Mass? That's right. Yeah. Because then you say, hey, keep, make it to Mass. In between I, the soccer it. tournaments right. and the dance recitals and landscaping and groceries and laundry, and we turn the Sabbath into a day to catch up. But if we really take God at His word, no pun intended, right? If we're entering into the Sabbath, that means over the course of the other 167 hours a week, we're not at Sunday Mass, mm -hmm. that we as a family are entering into what? Entering into the Mass. That's right. Entering into the readings, entering, bringing our own intentions. And, and, if we, and we show the up there prepared, the Liturgy of the Word comes right, to life right, in a different right. way. And that's the point, I think, too. You go back to the beginning and you realize, okay, for six days and then the seventh, and so there really is a sense in which God as a father is giving a pattern for his sons and his daughters so that your labor is going to be sanctified by the liturgy you celebrate. But that's not just one hour. Remembering the Sabbath is not recalling that it's the seventh day in the Old Testament any more than it's recalling it's the first day in the New. No, it's, it's commemorating, it's mm -hmm. celebrating. And so your work is ordered to worship, and then suddenly your life is united yep. under God. And, and not just under a creator, but under a, a God who wants to enter into a personal bond of friendship, a covenant. Amen. And I think one of the things you do, Mark, is you, you make it clear that the Scripture is a part of one life. It's not just five minutes here, but it really has something to say through your entire life and through the entire week, which I think is great. Yeah, we will be back with more from Francisco University Presents, so I invite you to stay with us. Franciscan, I'm um, part of the household disciples of the word um, and our household verse Hebrews 4.12 um, says that scripture speaks to the heart um, and in the same way um, I think we have our Bible study every Thursday night and um, we really just dive into the scripture um, and really try to um, see where it speaks to us and hear the word of God, hear his voice um, in the scriptures. What if you discovered a university with unmatched science, faculty and programs? a place where you didn't have to choose science over faith. At Franciscan University of Steubenville, you'll find faith-inspired, student-focused, research-driven programs leading to satisfying careers in medicine, scientific research, engineering, computer science, and many more science and health fields. At Franciscan University of Steubenville, education is more than just a word, it's a discovery. Welcome back and thank you so much for joining us. You're watching Franciscan University Presents, which we, we record here in the Com Art Studio at Franciscan University in Steubenville. Our students are operating the cameras and the equipment and members of our theology faculty, Dr. Regis Martin and Dr. Scott Hahn, and I are discussing unleashing the power of the scripture with Mark Hart. Mark, I had an experience one time when I was in seminary and it was, uh, it was with a group that were Catholics and Protestants. Mm -hmm. and. I brought one of the, the groups to uh, the Shrine of uh, Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C. Sure. And we had a conversation afterwards, and one of the gals said, she goes, I never imagined seeing so much scripture. She said, I was just surprised at the amount of scripture that's in your churches. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that goes to your point that you said at the beginning, that we know the scripture better than we thought because it's all around us. But you do a great job in the book about just how the scripture, first off, some of those just sayings that we have are related mm -hmm. to Scripture, but how the Mass is just alive and saturated with the Scripture. So maybe you could just speak to that, 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 that you can't go to the Mass, you can't go to a church without encountering the Word of God. I, I, it always blew my mind when I, was, when I started reading Scripture on my own, just holding in my own hands, leaving through a page. Did you know the blind follow the blind it comes from the Gospel of Matthew? Yeah. I had no idea. <laughs> I'll never forget it. I mean, I read that. I thought, wow, I've heard that before. That's so cool. Yeah. I mean, it, this is in the Bible. I had no, you know. I, I remember one time I was, I was, uh, I was at a pharmacy and I saw you know a snake wrapped around a staff. You know, as a sign of yeah. healing. I thought, oh, I know. I've read that somewhere yeah. before. You know, right, the writing numbers, on the wall. Verse twenty-one. The writing yeah. on the wall. Uh, you know, the apple of your father's eye, or Armageddon, or a wolf in sheep's clothing. There are all these these turns of phrase that I would hear my mom or my grandmother use, and I thought, this they're quoting the Bible, and the best part. They didn't know they were quoting the Bible. They're just using words. And all of a sudden you get into the Mass. And I'll never forget, I was reading 2 Corinthians one time. I see that the love of, you know, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and you know, the, old, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, you know, before the journey. Well, that comes out of 2 Corinthians? Yeah. So all of a sudden I started deep diving. I want to, say, I want to know where all these things come from. Did you know the word amen comes from Scripture? Yeah. I didn't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had no idea. And there's Ruth saying it in Ruth chapter 2. I thought, oh, wow, how about that? Way to go, Ruth. You start to look around the Mass. Every prayer at Mass, I mean, and not just every prayer, I mean, not just the spoken, but every movement. Yeah. That moment at Mass, I remember as an altar boy, I mean, 
the part where the priest goes and he washes his hands and there's an altar boy, I just thought, good hygiene. Yeah, that's great. Right, He's boy. washing his hands, right? Yeah, before. Yeah. And then to come find out that that's this beautiful prayer of repentance from King David from the Psalms. Mm. This moment where he talks about his own iniquity. Yeah. And it's just everything just came to life. I mean, dots were connecting it. It was almost as though the church in her wisdom understood something. Yeah. Yeah. That, hey, we're going to let the deacon elevate the book. Well, why? Well, actually, that's going to go back to the book of Numbers. I mean, right, the, right. I mean even the most, the subtlest movements right. that, that we encourage in the sanctuary, these are all scriptural. These are all biblical. Yeah. And I mean, and I remember the, the more, the more I, I learned this, the more I wanted to learn. My, my heart was just enraptured. Yeah, yeah. And you walk through the mass, you think, oh my goodness, someone that says the Catholics don't know their Bible, I mean, yeah. they've, they've, never, they've never walked through a liturgy well, the, with someone else. The mass is, is saturated with, with scripture. And I must thank you because I made a couple of happy discoveries in reading your book. I didn't know that, that, that uh, God whistled. Uh, but in Isaiah, we're told right. that he did. And I certainly didn't know that in addition to all of the other afflictions that poor Job had to endure, he had to face halitosis. Yes. Wife His wife says he has bad breath. Bad breath. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I guess some of those things are just for me. They're in the book, but yeah. yeah. Right. It's not just that the mass was developed in a way that's like, wow, we could really saturate ourselves in scripture. There really is a sense in which it's circular, that the New Testament, as I discovered, was a sacrament before it started to become a document. Mm -hmm. And that's what you find in the document, Luke 22, 20. Mm -hmm. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the New Testament. He doesn't say, write this in remembrance. He says, do this. Yeah. And so the church wasn't sitting around waiting for years, wondering what to believe until some of you guys start writing some right. gospels and epistles. Right. You mm -hmm. know, it was the word incarnated, then the word inspirated, but the New Testament is the Eucharist. And so no wonder the New Testament document ends up being canonized in 380 and the 390s, the same time the Roman canon was being canonized. This is the Eucharistic prayer. This is the liturgical collection of books that are going to be read in preparation to celebrate that. You know, it was Michael Legospi, I think, who was writing a dissertation at Harvard. He was still a Protestant at the time. And it ended up being entitled, The, uh, the Death of Scripture and the Rise of Modern Biblical Studies. And what he observes is that when you speak of Scripture, sacred Scripture, in the sacred liturgy, in the sacred tradition, you're talking about a holistic unity where people grow up as sons and daughters of God in this Catholic family, and they just know the Scriptures, even if they don't know chapter and verse. It wasn't until Sola Scriptura rips this book right. out of its liturgical mm -hmm. setting, its ecclesial context, right. context the mm -hmm. sacramental experience of hearing the Word of God. And then suddenly, you know, what Legospi points out is that it's in the German Protestant universities with pious scholars, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Johann David Michaelis, you know, who nevertheless says it's science, it's reason alone, you know, to make this safe for the, the, the secular German nation state to be more fully and truly Protestant. And he ended up becoming Orthodox as a result of his own scholarship. But I tell you, I, when I was working on a book with Ben Weicker that came out recently, it's called The Decline and Fall of Sacred Scripture, or How the Bible Became a Secular Book. Mm -hmm. And reading the un Unleashing the Power of Scripture reminds me that, you know, what's in a name? Bible, Scripture, potato, potato. But there is a sense in which sacred Scripture really does point us back to the Mass mm -hmm. and that sacramental life that we're living all seven days a week. Mm -hmm. Now, not just one hour out of one day, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm grateful for that. I would also say one other thing, too, and that is besides the Gospels and the Psalms and eventually everything else, Magnificat. You know, we've had uh, Father Sebastian White, the editor mm -hmm. of uh, Magnificat here, and he's a alum from Franciscan. But I have found that Catholics now, by the hundreds of thousands, are discovering the lectionary on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's the Old Testament, the Psalm and the Gospels. And so, of course, you hear it, but when you read it, later on when you hear it, if you're able to make it to daily Mass, or even if you can't, you know what Mother Church is doing with her children who are gathered. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, you know, 35 years ago when I became a Catholic, I didn't have enough faith to pray for the biblical literacy, the scriptural fluency that I'm seeing in a whole new generation of Catholics. Mm -hmm. And 
you're partly to blame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you talked about the, the access, the, mm -hmm. some of the apps that provide you, that just the opportunities to be sure. able to encounter the word more. Um, if, if I may, you also, I thought you did a beautiful job on the scriptures and the rosary. Again, mm -hmm. all of these things that we do, there is actually a connection to the scriptures. The rosary is the most perfect Bible study. I mean, and I, I didn't understand that. Yeah. I, I mean, I prayed the rosary for years. Thank God, Mom, thank you for teaching yeah, me how to pray the rosary. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I didn't realize what a treasure trove it was until it became older and more mature, right? And all of a sudden, when you start to pray the rosary, you say, wow, like this, this is a Bible study in and of itself. Yeah, that's right. Really, and it's actually what we were speaking about earlier, is instead of just trying to read a whole chapter or a whole book at a time, the rosary is this wonderful invitation. My old spiritual director, God rest his soul, he'd say, you know, the greatest gift in scripture is the period. Because mm. you get to the period, it's, an, it's God exhaling. It's an invitation oh, to stop. stop. That's great. Right. Just slow down. You know, slow down, Mark, mm -hmm. you know. And I still I still hear his voice just reverberating whenever I read scripture. But the rosary is so wonderful. I mean, how can you pray the rosary? And you know you love the rosary. How can you pray it every single day and it doesn't get old? Mm -hmm. How can you pray it throughout the day and it doesn't get old? I mean, when, when you, even when Pope John, St. John Paul II gave us the luminous mysteries, I don't think our church fully understands what a gift those were. Yeah, yeah. To, to be able to give us five new mysteries. I mean, after centuries? Yeah. People say, no. I mean, and I, I, I got stuck. I'd say, you picked five, you picked the proclamation of the kingdom? Really? Right. Really, JP2, really? And then all of a sudden you start to pray it and you go a little deeper. There may be something deeper. there. Wow, there something. he knew something, yeah. evidently, right? Yeah. yeah. But I think that's that's part of the glory of it is that you can pray scripture anywhere, right? And I, and there's so there's a pl the plurality of apps. I mean, to be able to have the, the daily readings, the breviary, the daily office. I'm so thankful for my breviary app because I can't figure out those ribbons. <laughs> That's really confusing. It, it can be very challenging, right? Yeah. So to be able to have it there, it's, they just dumb it down for me. And I love it. I mean, I love being able to have it there. Not so much because I want to read scripture from my phone, huh? right? But that when I'm just sitting at the doctor's office, yep. waiting yeah, for them yeah, to yeah. call my name, I mean, my, my good Lord, I hope that St. Peter calls my name sooner Quicker, than that. quicker, right. <laughs> but Bill, waiting, in the doctor's office, waiting in line at soccer practice for my, my yeah, son. Yeah, yeah. You have those moments you just think, I've got five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes to kill. Sure, I can look at Facebook, or sure, I can check the baseball scores or the football scores, but I could also just take a second and just Jump into the Very daily reading yeah, right. if, I, if I didn't make it to Mass. Or yeah. I agree to the Well, songs. you know, the, the staple of, of element in the rosary, of course, is the Hail Mary. And I was struck when Charles Pegui uh, said that one Hail Mary, piously said, is worth more than the whole of St. Thomas's Summa. <laughs> now, there was a certain anti-intellectual streak that ran through Pegui. But when you think about that prayer, I'm, I'm thinking about the last exhortation, pray for us now and at the hour of our death. And all of that time in between, who knows right. how long that will uh, uh, elapse. Mm -hmm. But to be always asking Mary to pray for me now, Adesso, uh, in the Kairos, and at the hour of my death, cover every base. I mean, that's very consoling. And, and inviting, inviting the Blessed Mother through her intercession to realign my own perspective into the, the life of Christ through her eyes, yeah. right? To be able to help me to see the face of Christ, to behold the face of Christ and the person who just cut me off in traffic right? and the person who got my order wrong at the restaurant yeah. and the person who is being ridiculous, you know, at the grocery or whatever it is, or even, even, you know, and I have teenagers, even in those eyes that are rolling their eyes at me in the rear of your mirror, to help me in that moment say, Mother Mary, give me, help me to see Christ in this soul right, right now. Oh, and that is a really important lesson for uh, life, right? The rosary has become my favorite prayer, mm -hmm. you know, since even before I entered the church. But I must admit that rereading the gospels through her eyes, praying before and after, it's amazing. But one time in particular, I've got to testify to this experience because I was finishing up my doctoral dissertation. I'd come to the climactic chapter. The main passage was Hebrews 9, 15 and 16. Mm -hmm. I thought I had nailed it. I realized, no, it's a better interpretation than my predecessors, but I don't exactly capture why a death is necessary for the covenant. And I had a deadline. It was like 48 hours and I didn't have an answer. And so that night in desperation around 1 a.m., I went out and prayed to Rosary. I'm like, Holy Mary, you don't owe me anything on this matter, but I could use some help, you know. You know what this verse means. You know what that phrase means. Nobody else even claims to, you know. And so I pray the rosary. I come back. I, I, I collapse in the bed, wake up at 7 a.m. I'm reading the passage, and all of a sudden, for the sake of the transgressions, it pops off the page. I'm like, huh, I never saw that connection. Oh, my, that's why the death is necessary. 
So I began to write it out. At my doctoral defense, that's what got me through. <laughs> there was one, Father Bill Kurtz said, mm -hmm. that's a breakthrough. And I'm like, thank you, Larry. You know, <laughs> praying a rosary. And it was like three below zero that night in January as well in the, the neighborhood of Steubenville. And she was like, Thanks for asking. Yeah, it'd be low. You be put mom sure. on the clock and there it worked out. I love this. Yeah. <laughs> only, only. Uh, maybe just only because you mentioned it uh, uh, three or four times. Mm. It's okay to write in the Bible. Oh, oh. I, oh I encourage it. Oh, <laughs> oh, a worn out Bible is a sign of a Catholic who's not. Yeah. I mean, it breaks my heart. I mean, and I was one of those purists. I thought, oh, I got this from my confirmation. If I underline it, it's got to be sacrilege. No, sacrilege is not to underline it, not to <laughs> highlight it, not to dog ear it. That Bible should be so ragged that someone walks in and sees it in your, in your bag on a table, they think, wow, that guy, that girl, she knows her stuff. I mean, yeah. and it's okay. And you know, and you know what, fill it up, fill it up, underline. The Lord is not, he's weeping for those who don't read scripture, not for those who do. I okay. I, you've <laughs> probably experienced this. So I had to make a change of a Bible maybe about eight or nine years ago because the other one was so falling apart <laughs> that I couldn't carry it with me. So I had to get a new one, but it was kind of a nice, a nice struggle to have. But I remember as a kid saying, is it okay to write in the Bible? And you say time and time again, it is. The other thing you say is to that there are some advantages, obviously, to having it on, on a Kindle or something sure. like that. So you're not saying you shouldn't do that, but you should always have a scripture that you can turn It's a page. both and. Okay. It's great having it on your phone, having it on your Kindle. It's easy access. I mean, gosh, you can get into the footnotes and commentaries, which are tremendous. But there's something about having something tactile, having it in your hands. Okay, real quick. Your Bible. You mentioned the type of Bible, what uh, copy you want to have, but you also talk about getting something that has good Commentaries. Commentaries. Just speak about that. Yeah. It's it's like having a trusted friend who's going to walk you through. You know, you get lost in a neighborhood. I'm going to walk you. I'm not just going to tell you what street to go down. I'm going to walk you home. Okay. So having a uh, having other ancillary like the, the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible that I know that you worked on with Curse, a tremendous resource. There's there's so many resources now. When I first started reading scripture, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, Good news there wasn't anything there. I mean, I was going into these Bible stores and there was nothing there. It was like to make something Catholic, you had to take out King David and put in the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now there's all these tremendous resources that exist, both electronic and written. You just have to get a imagine. trusted Catholic one that really does make it simple. Amen. And up next, our panel and our guests will share their final thoughts on unleashing the power of the Scripture. Stay with us. Growing up, um, I was always exposed to the, the Gospel, and my parents would um, have me read Scriptures but I was never taking it to heart until more recently where I started diving into the Gospel of Matthew and uh, found that I was not living up to what Jesus was saying and now I'm trying to incorporate that into my daily life. I love the scriptures because I love the Mass. Growing up, I fell in love with the Mass at a young age, going to Mass during the week with my family. And that was where I first got to encounter the power of scripture, both in the prayers of the Mass and in the daily readings. And so now here at Franciscan, having the opportunity to study scripture and also having it be, become an integral part of my daily prayer has been so vital to me. There is a place where education begins and faith and reason connect. Franciscan University of Steubenville's online programs will advance your career through an e-learning experience that's both academically excellent and passionately Catholic. With online degrees taught by full-time professors in theology, catechetics, business, education, and other disciplines, you can earn your master's degree online without changing your lifestyle. Find out more today at franciscan.edu, where your faith and career can connect online. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We've come to our final, sec uh, final segment. So Regis, if you could start us off with your yeah, thoughts. Yeah, uh, it, it uh, used to be the case, I, I, I think, that uh, among Catholics, a, a fair number of us, we never read the scriptures. Mm -hmm. But then among an alarming number of scripture scholars who did read it uh, minutely, meticulously, they had very little reverence for what they read. Uh, and that kind of reductionism, I think, wreaked havoc upon Catholic biblical scholarship and ordinary piety in the pew. Uh, you know, 
nobody was interested uh, in, in the inspired Word of God. I remember talking to a scripture scholar in Rome when I was a student, and he had memorized, I think, about a dozen languages, including Aramaic and Coptic. And I was no end of impressed. I said, you know, this must really enhance your appreciation for God's Word. And he said, you know, we never talk about God. We bracket those questions. Right. We're too busy. We're too busy doing scripture scholarship, mm. murdering to dissect, <laughs> as the poet Wordsworth would put it. I mean, I mean, this, this is sort of cheaply polemical, but the Word became flesh, the Word did not become paper, but there's a sense in which the paper that talks about the Word is sacramental. It signifies more than simply the paper. And thanks to you guys uh, and others like you, there is a renewed interest uh, in Scripture. I mean, the Second Vatican Council had something to do mm -hmm. with that uh, uh, impetus. We, we see it, we encounter it every single day at Mass. But you guys have shored up the argument for that and have made them so fetching, so winsome, that you'd have to be a fool not to want to immerse yourself in the study of Scripture, particularly during Lent. So thanks very much for all that you've done. And you too, Scott. And you too, Father. I think you read this. Scott, final well, thoughts? You, know, you remind me of what the Catechism says, that when we come to the Catholic faith, it's not a religion of the book the way the Jews speak of Tanakh, or even Protestants speak of sola scriptura. It's a religion of the Word, but the Word is a person mm -hmm. who became flesh. And the incarnation of the Word doesn't in any way subvert the inspiration of the Word. They really are like, you know, one hand washing the other. Ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ, but vice versa. And I used to speak of the sacramentality of Scripture and thinking I'm kind of, you know, it's a little edgy. And then in Verbum Domini, Pope Benedict speaks of it <laughs> repeatedly, you know. And I think that captures something. But these big, beautiful, lofty liturgical notions have got to be tethered. They've got to be brought down to earth. And that's what your work does. You know, I, we were talking about resources a minute ago. You know, I would say Unleashing the Power of Scripture is a great place for ordinary Catholics to start. I've already mentioned Magnificat, mm -hmm. you know. Our St. Paul's Center website and our resources have material for mm -hmm. beginner, intermediate, and advanced. You mentioned the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible. We began in January of 98. We finally finished mm -hmm. right after Christmas in 2020. We were able to kind of devote COVID. You know, it's going to be out in 2022. So later this year, Lord willing, uh, the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible, Old Testament and New in one volume. And that's designed not just for beginners, but to make them intermediate and advanced by going deeper, prayerfully studying Scripture, but studying Scripture as well. Mm -hmm. You know, and I just want to say thank you for not only writing the book, but also spreading this infectious faith. I mean, it's a very healthy thing, this <laughs> contagion of God's Word, but uh, keep it up. Thanks, God. I think so. Final thoughts, Mark? You know, um, you know, when you travel a lot and you speak a lot and people will come up to you after a talk, you know, and they'll say, oh, gosh, I wish I would have heard this when I was young. Right, right. I wish I would have heard this when I was a teenager. It's never too late. Right. It's, it's, it, is, it is never too late. I'll say, well, I don't have the right translation. The right translation is the one that's in your hands. Yeah, maybe you can get a better Catholic study Bible, but the one that's in your hands, the one that's on your shelf, like, it's never too late. And, and I think that, you know, death is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Sickness is going to come. Economies are going to fail. Divorces are going to have, we're a fallen, we're a fallen race. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're fallen. We're sinners. And the beauty is, is that you don't have to wonder. You don't, know, you don't have to wonder anymore. What does God think about this sin? How, what does God think about this action or thought or temptation? It's right there. Page after page, chapter after chapter, century after century, we don't have to wander or wander. It, it shows us right there in black and white that, that we don't have to wander. Oh, does, does God only love me for what I do? No. That page after page, you have, a, you have a Father who loves you for who you are in spite of your sin, in spite of your selfishness, in spite of all those temptations in your fallen age, He loves you. And in the midst of all this hopelessness and darkness and wonder and stress and anxiety, here comes the Lord, just crashing our existence. We can't be at Mass 24 hours a day. Oh, how I wish we could, and someday we will, right? In, yeah, in eternity. Indeed, indeed. But we can't have the Word of God Amen. in our hand 24 hours a day. So have one on your nightstand, have one on your coffee table, have one in your purse, have one in your backpack, have one in your car. It should be embarrassing how many Bibles we have, <laughs> so that it's always within arm's reach, because you never know the moment that the Holy Spirit's going to ordain with a child, a spouse, a grandchild, a neighbor that comes over to borrow milk, that He's going to put somebody in your life who 
doesn't necessarily need you, but desperately needs Christ in you. And, and to have the eternal Word of God within an arm's reach, yeah, that's, right. that's the moment. That's the, God's going to ordain the time. Mm-hmm. And you never know what's going to happen. It's going to be an inopportune time, I guarantee it. The Holy Spirit does not work on our timetable. Right. But it's going to be so blessed. And the more that we can just say to ourselves, I can close this window, I can turn off Facebook, I'll, I'll DVR the game, but I'm going to spend 15 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day in the Word of God. God has not done, has not done in generosity. It's going to come back. Amen. Well, thanks so much, Mark. If you'd like to hear more about this, we've got a, one of the articles from Mark's book that will be available to you. It's yours free if you simply go online to faithandreason.com or call the number that you're going to see on the screen in just a moment. Um, we mentioned a Magnificat a couple of times, which has been a great blessing, but there's also the Word Among Us, mm-hmm. and, and I believe the Word Among Us published this, did it, it not? Mm-hmm. Yep. And then I've, actually I have both. I have a subscription to Word Among Us, and I have one to Magnificat, and they've both been blessings for me to be able to bring me into the Word of God, so I've been very help, it's been very helpful for me. Um, we, we all talked about this encounter that we had with the Lord, and I remember uh, I was a 21-year-old kid, and it's when I really experienced uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the God just coming His life. And, and I remember the next day, it was um, something from Matthew in taking a look in the Scriptures, like you said earlier, something that I had read 50 times before, right? It came alive. It came alive for me. And, and Aquinas talks about experiencing the Holy Spirit. There's an innovation. Something new comes about from that. And that's really what I experienced when I experienced the power of the Holy Spirit in my life more, was that the Word became, I would read something and it actually had something to say to me. And I think that's what you do so beautifully, is, is the Scriptures have something to say to us. When I'm often preaching about the Word of God, and, and the reality is, is it's not always the case, that we read something that just transforms our life or changes our life. And I remind people that the problem isn't in the Word, right? The problem mm-hmm. is not in the Scriptures. The problem's in me, that, that if the Word doesn't inspire and anoint and, and move and speak to and give direction, it's not the Word of God that, the pro- that has the problem, right. yeah. that I have the problem. Yeah. And that's where I take a moment or two, as you said earlier, Scott, uh, and I just say, come Holy Spirit, you know, just speak to me. And, and I find that Time and time again, the Lord wants to move in my heart. He wants to bring me peace. He wants to bring me clarity. He wants to bring me comfort. It's, as I'm getting older, it becomes that companion that's familiar, mm. that I've heard this word before. I've heard this voice before, and it just settles my heart. Mm. So I ask that the Lord would pour out His blessing and His grace upon you, that the Word of God would come alive in your heart, that you'd know the peace and the presence that comes from the Word that is made flesh. May the Lord bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Download a free handout on today's topic at faithandreason.com, where you can also watch past episodes of Franciscan University Presents. Or request the handout by emailing us at presents at franciscan.edu. Or reach us by phone for today's handout by calling 800-783-6447. That's 800 783-6447.